We are live. Good evening, everyone. Once again, we're here back at the barbershop talking about great information, giving out information to our colleagues and to our guests that are follow us here at the DYCB Barbershop. This is part two of a two-part series talking about uh, understanding your bag or getting, uh, getting uh, uh, being 700. That's your FICA score. We're talking about everyone making sure that you're 700. In our last uh, conversation we had, just to quickly catch you up, we talked about gratification, gratification and learning to be able to, uh, to not really sacrifice, but be able to delay some of your gratification that you want. Also, we talked about understanding your budget. A lot of times we don't understand our budgets and that gets us into trouble very often. We also understand about uh, how to use some things that you're buying, how to invest in what you're buying, things that you like a lot, invest in them. And that's a way of helping to make money and to be able to uh, build wealth. Also, we talked about cascading and snowballing, how to get out of debt. So we want to be able to get, if you haven't hear, heard these things and gotten into it, please check out our YouTube video that we did for the last one about uh, fiscally, getting fiscally straight so that we can uh, build move, moving forward. But this one, we're going to be talking about building wealth. For those of us who have a nickel and a dime together, and we're trying to rub them and trying to stretch it. This conversation is going to start talking about how do we build wealth? How do we build it for the next generation? How do you build wealth for your future? How do you get prepared for what's coming up? How do you have a good rainy day bag? How do you get your bag right, as they say? So I have my colleagues on that are always on Barbershop with me. Jerry, how you doing, Jerry? Man, I'm, I'm really, really good. I'm excited to be in the Barbershop. I was so excited from the first part that I even let myself go just a little bit so I can get a fresh cut, everything great for this conversation, so I can take this all in. Um, I actually had to just redo my budget after I heard from Dr. Richardson, who I lovingly call, as well as Dale and all these amazing panelists. So I'm just excited. I have a couple of youth, young adults, and even um, older laymen that just can't wait to hear some stuff. So I'm ready for this conversation. Hey, Mike, how you doing now? I'm good, Scott. I'm good, Jerry. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to, to do this and to be in the barbershop. And I tell you, I've been um, spending a lot of time with and reviewing a lot of affairs for my mother and my uncle. So this idea of reviewing budgets and expenses and, and, and trying to safeguard people's information and, and try and figure out what the plan is. I, I am almost overwhelmed in this conversation, but, uh, you know, we, we keep it real. We keep it 100 and we keep it 700 in the barbershop. So that's not going to, that's not going to stop anything. So I say all that to say, I am listening to learn today. I'm going to be asking questions just like I hope everyone on the YouTube uh, stream and really listening to, to learn, uh, you know, we say steel sharpen steel. And, uh, I'm thankful that we have so many, wonderful and uh, helpful uh, panelists who have so much information. So like, I hope people are taking notes. Like you said, go back and, and check session one if you didn't already and figure out how to get out of debt. But if you got a nickel and a dime to rub together and want to try to get a quarter and a dollar, this is the session for you. So. And, and I really want to uh, push people, get up and go get a pad right now. Do not sit here and listen to this. As we get ready to do the introduction, get a pad, a pencil, and sit down in front of the screen because the jewels that are going to come out tonight may make the difference in your future and your children's future. So with that said, I'm going to introduce the first person, this lovely young lady named uh, Heather. How you doing, Heather? Come introduce yourself, Heather. Hi there. You said young lady, so I was thrown <laughs> off there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, thank you so much. I'm Heather Daly from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or New York Fed. And um, that is for, for anyone who's not uh, familiar, we're part of the Central Bank of the United States, which means we're a bank for banks. We're a bank for the United States government. It also means that you interact with us every day. And in a lot of ways, you know, we're, we're a bank for all of us participating in the United States economy. 
And um, we're really excited to be here tonight, you know, sort of share the message, talk a, a lot about, you know, why we care. And so not only from the Fed's perspective, can I share why we care so much about making sure everyone can take full advantage of the opportunities that are out there, but also uh, because I'm a parent, I'm a mom. So, you know, kind of happy to share some of the struggles I've had trying to talk through money issues and things like that with my kids. And before I hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Devon Bodie, I'm just going to mention real quickly because we're part of the central bank that um, any opinions we share our own not necessarily those the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System you may or may not know the Fed can move the stock market so we don't want to we don't want to impact your investments this evening <laughs> thanks so much Ms. Bodhi yeah and thank you Heather um, so hi everyone my name is Savon Bodhi I work at the New York Fed like Heather said um, and I'll just say that a lot of where my passion lies is just understanding financial systems, understanding the structural barriers that play a very large role in determining our outcomes. Um, but however, there are practical choices that we can make to, to improve our finances, improve our, um, our incomes, our financial lives, and our wealth holdings. I think that's the goal for, for everyone. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to your questions. So Jerry, you want to introduce a couple of our guests for us? Sure. Uh, I'll start off with, um, like I said, my personal favorite, Dr. Richardson. So um, I love we call him Dr. Richardson because I, I took some gems away from him. But um, Eric Richardson, who is the founder and CEO of Growth uh, Development Associates, I'm going to take a step back if you want to add to that or just enhance the same way you enhanced me in the last series. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, we've uh, 28 years ago began a process of building personal finance education that everybody can understand. We first built it, we started with 35 foster care kids, 15, 16, 17, for eight Saturdays in a row, volunteer attendance. We started with 35 kids, we finished with 35 kids and nine parents, because the parents started coming. So the comments that I'll be making are from those eight courses. And before we're done today, I'll tell you where you can get your hands on them. But you can build wealth and financial stability for yourself, for your family, and you can coach your neighbors. So I agree with uh, what Brother Andrew said. Uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, Brother Scott. Get out a pad of paper because you're going to want to take some action from this conversation tonight. Awesome, awesome. And my next favorite who cannot be undone, an amazing orator, champion of wealth, and, and done me a lot of favors, no pun intended, uh, as relates to wealth, but I need to give it up to Dale I. Favors, who is the managing partner um, for Adaptive Growth Leadership. And um, just if you could speak for yourself, I do not want to take away from an amazing reputation and all the gems that you shared before that I know you're going to drop today. Oh, you know, I'm pleased to be here because what we find out in life is we have an opportunity to learn something new every day we wake up. And what is what is what could be old, but what happens to be new is relationships. And this we're all here, I would say for myself and for several other people is because of you all and, and started with a relationship that I have with Mr. Bobbitt, with Mr. Mike Bobbitt, and I go way back. And throughout the years of me managing uh, adaptive growth leadership, as well as working corporate, I had the opportunity to meet other people that are on this on this uh, call today and then being able to partner with Mr. Eric Richardson and learn from him. I get excited every time we work together because I know that we're doing something special. But then I bring it back to Miss Heather and Miss Devon and what I do outside of managing my company every day, which is we try to change lives by creating opportunities for other people who are on their way up as well as those who are looking for pathways to economic success. But I also am a professor of economics. And I tell people there's two jobs that the Federal Reserve has, and it's very important. One is to keep everyone employed, and one is to monitor and manage inflation. And that is so important. We know that, Ms. Heather, you can move markets by what you say. Or is that Jerome Powell? Not sure. But awesome to have you all. I hope it's not me. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's part, it's where I'm pleased to be a part of this. So I thank you all for having me. 
Awesome, and, awesome. Now I know, Dale, you had other people you were, you were going to bring in as well. Oh, man. You know, last time we talked about if you love something, own it. So if you love sneakers, Nike sneakers, Air Force Ones, Jordans, own the stock. And people were like, okay, that sounds good. How do I go buy that stock? Well, let us first put you with some people who can help guide you in the process of not just buying that stock, but buying other stocks. So I bring to you Mr. Derek Harrison uh, and, and his team, which includes Brian, and they can tell you a little, I'll let Derek tell you a little bit about what they do. Derek? Great. Thanks so much, Dale. Um, and by the way, I wish I had the superpower to move markets. That would be awesome. So Heather, that's, uh, that's an amazing power. Um, but listen, uh, I'm with WFG. And um, as Dale said, and if you watch the first show, um, it was obvious that the, <laughs> our country is great at developing professional consumers. Everybody in our country is a, a professional consumer. It's everywhere. It's on television. Mm -hmm. um, we are taught from a young age to consume, consume, consume. But on the other side of it, there is no financial supermarket. You can walk in on the corner of your neighborhood and see what the financial products are that you can pick off and buy and use for yourself. Um, I, I forget who said it, but I remember this quote as um, that the concentration of power is the, the definition of a despot. Um, the dispersion of power is the definition of democracy. And along with, with that goes transparency and knowledge. And that's really what we're in the business of doing is trying to empower people to make decisions for themselves that will put themselves in a better position down the road. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Brian, um, as well. So I'll hand it off to Brian. So I don't know if, if I can be as articulate as that, Derek. That was, uh, <laughs> that was, I have no, I don't have any quotes handy to, to comment on, but but uh, like you, I'm, I'm jealous of, of Heather and Devon's ability to move the stock market because I haven't quite figured that out. Um, yeah, the, the, the company that we're involved with is a, a company called World Financial Group, and it's really a marketing and distribution uh, brokerage for financial products. And, and the thing that I've, I've come to realize is that as much as we have access to information at our fingertips on the internet and whatnot, there's, a, there's such an amount of disinformation and misinformation and distrust um, that people don't really know where to go, where to turn to, and the uh, resources for which they have to, to ask questions about financial. Some people don't feel like they make enough money in order to ask the, the right question. They don't feel like they have the, the right altitude in order to ask the questions. And so we, get, uh, we, have, a, um, we have a society here of folks who, who want to do better, but just don't know the means, the, way of, uh, the ways of going about doing that. So our company is really focused on, on creating the pathway, creating education and awareness around how financial products work. And because we work with 300 different kinds of companies and thousands of financial products, we can find the right solution for an individual, for a family, for a small business um, to define their path and make sure that they, uh, that they get access to information. For, for example, and folks know what a 401k is, but do, the, do folks really know what a 401k is and how a 401k works and where they got concept behind a 401k came about, what it was intended for? Does it serve the same purpose today that it did when it was originally created? Um, how does a 401k work as far as taxes are concerned? All of those things around just a 401k, that's one subject. So those are the kinds of things that we um, educate people on, help them make decisions that are right for them and their future, uh, their family and where they want to go in the future. So thrilled to be here. Uh, I love this. I love this format. I love this concept. I'm excited about, uh, about sharing some of the stuff that we do and hopefully have an engaged conversation. It's going to be fun. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, man. I'm going to throw it over to Mike now. All right, coming because we have more guests too. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back to the barbershop. Uh, the panelist was with us back in January on the topic of personal transformation. So he has insight and personal and professional experience to share with us today. So welcome back, Andrew A. Ericadu Esquire, Asset Manager for Florida Real Estate Associates, LLC, and owner of Bay Area Community Housing. Welcome back, Andrew. Everybody, um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Mike said, uh, I'm an attorney. Um, my practice largely revolves and revolved around uh, 
uh, litigation and business uh, consulting management. Um, I've advised several individuals and uh, companies and corporations, large and small, on asset management, building wealth, uh, avoiding debt, working their way out of debt, uh, how to deal with uh, financial crises, et cetera. Um, come at it slightly differently, I think, than some of the other uh, panelists. Uh, I've advised quite a few people on, uh, including myself, on wealth building sort of on a street level up, right? Like, how do you buy your first investment property? Um, if you need to borrow money, who should you borrow it from? Or if you want to lend money to make a little money in interest, who should you lend it to? Um, how do you secure that loan if you do that? That sort of thing. So sort of street level investing, um, you know, uh, building from your first couple thousand to your first couple hundred thousand, that sort of thing. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, a new uh, contact that I'm glad we've we've met. Welcome to the barbershop, Nina Uguomo. Hopefully I said that right. Correct me if I didn't. Founder, president, and CEO of Student Dream. Yeah, you, you get a, an A minus. So good job. <laughs> hey, y'all. So just pardon, pardon my background. I just could not get the green screen to, to operate. But we are still in the barbershop. And I am Nina Ubuomo. I'm the founder, CEO, and president of Student Dream. And we are a financial education nonprofit that trains students of color to build wealth. We do that through content and courses that teach them about personal finance, investing, and entrepreneurship so that they can graduate college debt-free with an emergency fund, relevant work experience, and a job they enjoy. We've been able to uh, gain support from the Obama administration, Techstars, uh, Google, Carnegie Hall to run our programs. And we've worked with New York City. Right now we're working with Newark. And it's been really great. We've worked with over a thousand young people. They've started companies. They've raised over a million dollars in business funding and they're building wealth. And so I'm very hands-on, action-oriented when it comes to building wealth. I think it's super important for young people, not just to learn the theory, but actually to do it. And I believe that their greatest asset is their time. And so we really help them to leverage that. Uh, and, it's, and it's a great experience. So I'm glad to be here. It's quite a pleasure. So we got a full deck, Scott. Yes, we do. So we're gonna go ahead and jump in there because we're looking about building wealth and building the next generation of wealth and even what little bit of wealth we can. And part of what I did here, here and I you know, talked to Dr. Richardson, one thing I do remember you saying that the seven ways that I believe you said for home ownership, and that is one of many avenues that you can begin to build wealth, but it's not the only avenue. So I know that's one of the avenues, but because at this group right now, we wanna to talk to our, our constituents who's out there listening, saying that these are the people, they have a little nest egg, they don't have a big one, they have a little nest egg, and they're trying to hang on to it or figure out what's the next step to building wealth. So I'm just gonna throw it out to the whole group. Anyone who can start, talk, start us off by talking about what are some of the first steps that, that people should start taking if they're looking to build wealth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in just because I, I can't hold it. But one thing I just want to say kind of as an umbrella to the conversation, anybody you know today who is a high school student or in college, every person you know is already a millionaire. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. If someone averages $40,000 a year of income, from age 20 to age 60. That's $2.4 million they're going to earn in their lifetime. So a million dollars is not an un unthinkable number that's out of our range. We will all go through multiple millions of dollars just going through life. So the thing I want you to remember, the thing I want to put as a kind of an umbrella over this conversation, wealth is not how much money you make. It's how much money you keep. And if you listen to the panelists today and figure out which approach, which process, which tools fit best with the way you think, 
If you figure out how to keep a little bit of money out of every paycheck and invest it, whether it's in stocks, mutual funds, IRAs, or owning your own home, you can easily build wealth for your family. Well, it doesn't matter how much money you make. Wealth is not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. I'll add to that um, because uh, like a good assistant surgeon, I follow behind the doctor and, and um, you know, and, and we're, we're coming into the barbershop to get our fresh cut as well, Jerry. And the, the pieces, what Eric always talks about is real simple. He, if, if everyone remembers, he talked about just buying a cup of coffee. So if you happen to be a Starbucks fan and you want to buy a four or five dollars, so maybe for some seven, if they get the, the extra whipped cream, whatever it is every day, then if you take that money and you say, I'm not going to do that for one year and you save that money, there's your money right there to now go and make your first initial investment. And you get to go talk to someone like a Derek or a Brian to discuss what you may want to do, which it really starts with, and I'll, I'll hand it off to Derek and Brian, it really starts off with, you have to understand what the consumer, what that person's goal is. So they walk up to you, they said, hey, I've saved my coffee money for a year and I have two, $3,000. What am I going to do with this? That's the conversation that usually comes your way, right, Derek? Correct, correct. So um, thanks for that, Dale. And I think it's important to keep in mind what Dale said is every person is different, every person is unique and those conversations. And that's, that's why we talk about seeking out resources. That was a big theme, I think, in the first session that we had and all the different resources that are available on a government level, on a um, private level, um, and in, um, well, I was gonna say in a school level, but we know how financial education is lacking in our schools. Um, but I think it really comes down to, and we can start to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but, um, Everybody, and we talked about this, should have an emergency fund, right? As things come up, whether it's fixing appliances or your car breaks down or you lose your job or COVID, things more serious, um, you want to be in a position where you're not making decisions that you wouldn't otherwise make because you're in, in uh, behind the eight ball. Um, but when people come to us to talk about that, it's really like, well, how do I do that? And it's the concept of paying yourself first, right? Um, we talked about that. If you wait until you pay your, your, your rent or your mortgage and your bills and try to pay off a little bit of debt, um, there's not going to be anything left at the end of that. So why don't we flip it and start to pay ourselves a little piece in the beginning? Um, I think it was Seku who said, there are many different apps out there and different types of things that you can set it and forget it um, to do that automatically because it's it's almost too hard for a person to have that type of discipline or it's a lot more helpful. So one thing that we have is um, what we call a Transamerica Alpha app. And they're in all the other different financial institutions, I'm sure have their own and they're readily available. But it allows you to go in and basically set that uh, a certain amount that you can then put into this special account. And within that special account, you can earmark it for certain um, certain items. So it's almost like having it, stuffing an envelope full of um, of that money each each month, each week, whatever it happens to be. Um, so as you shoebox that money, it could be one of those uh, goals could be, you know, your emergency fund and to build that up. Another could be to save for a, a purchase, whether that's a car or a house, a down payment. Um, so you don't have to, to pay as much interest on that um, down the road. Um, it could be for things like healthcare, which in this country eat up quite a bit of money as well. So, um, so we do have, have tools like that available um, as we get into kind of the nuts and bolts that people can utilize. And sometimes it's scary and sometimes you do need to kind of talk to someone to get it up and running. But just think of how many different things people use their phones for and how prevalent they are. Um, I remember listening to the speech that Elon Musk gave uh, not too long ago. He's like, 
people are already cyborgs. You have a device in your hand that can go uh, communicate with anybody around the world in seconds. You can look up any piece and bit of information you want um, through the searching, um, as well as many other things. So you can take that and apply that to finance, and you may just need a little bit of help to get started or where to look. But we certainly aren't the only place to look. Um, but like we talked about before in the first um, session, I wasn't there, but um, you just have to make that decision that you want to do that. I just want to reflect back something that you said that struck me when you talked about paying yourself and paying yourself first. And uh, Dale referenced this and Scott referenced this. We talked about this a little bit in the last session about delayed gratification. And I feel like we shifted that conversation. So that's why I want to circle back to that now, which is, is it really delayed gratification? Are you really sacrificing something? Oh, I got to save money. I would rather do this, but I'd rather save money. It's so painful, right? If you're putting a plan out in front of yourself about I'm going to do this once a week for the next year, because it's going to keep me from lying awake at night, trying to figure out how the heck I'm going to get out of my situation. Doesn't that help you go to sleep better now? So it's not really delaying gratification. It's shifting what gratifies us. And you you hit me really well. I want to dwell on this thing about paying yourself first. I was thinking about that coffee example, right? If you work at a job and they say, well, you know, we'll either pay you this much salary or this much whipped cream on your coffee. You're not going to you're not going to focus on the coffee like put the money in my hand. I'll decide when I want to buy some coffee. I'll decide how much. We, so if we're going to prioritize paying yourself first. Are you going to pay yourself in coffee or in money that you're going to reinvest in yourself and in your dreams? It's not even it's not even delayed gratification when you look at it that way. It's just sensible thinking. You know, if you don't do it first, you don't get to it. Let me, let me put some math to this coffee example so that you understand what these gentlemen are trying to take. If instead of buying a $4 cup of coffee every day, you say, I'm going to invest that in an average mutual fund. You don't even have to knock it out of the park. Average mutual funds have yielded 7% for the last 100 years. So let me explain to you what they're trying to say. $4 a day times 22 working days a month is $88 a month that you can put into your mutual fund. If you do, instead of going to get coffee every day on the way to work, that's the only change you make in your life. Instead of buying coffee, you put $4 a day into a mutual fund from age 22 to age 52. That's a quarter of a million dollars. I'm not telling you not to buy coffee. I'm just telling you how much it costs. And you get to make that decision. Well, can I add to this? Because I think Eric, first of all, this is this is pun intended. His whole pro, his whole financial education platform is called Decisions Decisions, and so we make decisions every day. And <clears throat> and the decision to buy that coffee or save the money is a personal decision. You can make that decision. You don't have to have the coffee because in most places. Their companies have free coffee at work. And maybe what you do is you buy one can of whipped cream and you leave it in a refrigerator at work and you put that on top of your coffee. There you go. Okay, you want you want some flavoring? How about buy the, the liquid coconut or whatever flavor, leave it in the refrigerator at work? Now, you, you spent maybe of the two things combined, you spent $7, which is one of those cups of coffee. And you can have as many free cups of coffee at work as you choose. That could potentially happen, but that's also, and, and I'll bring this to what Sekou talked about, which many of you talked about on the front end, was keeping it keeping it 700 plus, which is he was talking about your credit score. And I think that many of us make a choice every time we go to make a purchase <clears throat> on, are we going to use credit or are we going to pay cash? And that has an impact on your credit score either way. And I think under, managing credit is extremely important. I dropped that in the hands of Ms. Heather, because I'm sure... This is something that you all at the and, and Devon at the well, Devon Party. had a great Devon was going to make a great point. There it is. Yeah, no. Well, I'm just listening to y'all talk. And for me, I'm all about 
meeting people where they are. Um, and just to do some, some ground setting, some level setting. First of all, I just want to share a great idiom that I've heard once from a good book called The Color of Wealth. And it said, income is like a river. Wealth is like a reservoir. Income can change on a dime and wealth changes throughout generations. Um, so it's, it's very different, but they do go hand in hand because even though wealth does provide a lot more opportunities for people, it's the income part that really keeps people from even meeting their basic needs, uh, meeting their expenses, uh, whether it's paying for childcare, paying rent, paying their bills. And just to drop a couple of uh, statistics for everyone, um, the Federal Reserve found that about 40% of Americans said that they can't even pay a $400 emergency bill uh, without taking out a loan or without borrowing money from family members or friends. And meanwhile, there's another survey that um, by, bank, by bank rate actually, they found that a quarter of people have more credit card debt than they do money and savings. So it's like, I do believe savings is one of the greatest vehicles, especially that savings that are automatic, uh, savings that are taken out by your employer before you even see your paycheck. But there are a lot of factors of just instability within a household that can that can hinder uh, that can hinder that type of wealth building. And I think it does it it does come out to more than just a, a coffee expense. Yeah, and I and I would add. Add to that, De Devon's point, it's important to understand that we all know that, you know, the good things we ought to do, whether that's exercise, eat right, uh, not buy that extra cup of coffee, but we don't do that. And one of the key aspects of personal finance that is often overlooked is that it's personal and that it's psychological and that you need to keep in mind those realities when you're trying to empower, not just inform, but empower people to build wealth. And so per, in particular, when it comes to, you know, where do I start in order to build wealth? You need to start with the, the individual person and what's going to motivate them. So the reason why our organization is called um, Student Dream is because we understand the importance of having a vision and having a dream because that's what's going to motivate you. Marketing agencies understand that people are motivated not by Nike shoes, but by finding your greatness. That people, Adidas understands that people are motivated not just by, again, some, some great trainers, but by Beyonce and her, her awesomeness, right? And so those are the, the messages that they communicate. So for anyone who's listening, and watching and you want to build wealth, you have to understand that personal finance, number one, is personal. So what's your vision? What's your motivation, right? I'm not just going to forego Starbucks because I want to build wealth. I'm going to forego Starbucks because I want to be able to go to Greece in a few weeks, you know, or because I want to be able to enjoy my lifestyle or because I do, I am naturally financially motivated and I actually do want to build wealth or I just want to be able to buy a house where family from Nigeria can come stay and it's not just myself, right? So number one, personal finance is personal, so get your vision. Number two, I would say that you need to understand how to build. So the people who are building wealth, they understand how to build and create value either for a company or for clients. And you have to build out those builder skills. I think one of the most underestimated builder skills are in the area of, of writing, right? So whether that's not just writing code, but just writing, because writing allows you to build intellectual property, whether that's in the form of a script, a piece of music, a film, it can be a line of code, you can write all these different aspects that can turn into intellectual property. So we often talk about real estate, build real estate, which is great, but one of the easiest ways to build your assets and your wealth is learning how to write and build things so that you can build intellectual property. Um, I love that music is often overlooked and kind of uh, looked at with contempt in its ability and capacity to build wealth for people because they focus often on uh, performance 
But when you think about people who are really making money, it's in the areas of songwriting, sync licensing, because they were able to take a pen and paper and create intellectual property. So number one, build your builder skills and then learn how to build a team, right? It's when it comes to people who have wealth, they're not working every day because they understand how to build team and the, the asset of human capital. And so that's another area. Learn how to build a team because that's going to increase your capacity and that's going to allow you to have those additional rivers of income that will then allow you to do the rest of the items you need to do, whether it's investing in your 401k, your IRA, real estate, et cetera. Wow. You, uh, you, you said a lot and, and I do want to put out there, I think both you and, and Devon, your point and in the barbershop, we're really never trying to attack anyone. And so whether it's uh, coffee or going to the movies or a pair of sneakers or whatever it is, you know, like you're right, like we're all, all of us, literally, we are all making choices and decisions and sometimes we're making trade-offs. So I, I, I like this idea and I feel like you kind of really leaned into and developed this idea about shifting our gratification <clears throat> because you, you took it back to the individual. We're all making choices. Let's make powerful ones and let's think about as a result of our choices where are we going you know so I, I really love what you said about your organization and the and the and the dream and putting out powerful things you also took it to another level talking about building out your 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 teams and investing in your your yourself so that was another accelerant <laughs> for our conversation i think I I just want to add something, if I, if I could, something that each of you said. So first of all, when I have a conversation with folks about those, those choices about coffee, I usually say, as you're, as you're driving towards the Starbucks to get your you know, venti vanilla latte, it's $7 each or whatever, you can do that or imagine yourself sitting in a piazza in Florence drinking a real latte, right? And so the choice that you're making is make, buy it today. That's that instant gratification thing. Or save it so you can go experience it, right? It's not about the things it's about. And so that's a, a mindset shift that, that, you know, that's required. The other thing I was going to say, and then I think you make a great point and, and something that's happening right now, we are in the infancy watching this, you know, these, these NFTs, non-fungible tokens, this is the future of creativity, you know? And so I don't know, not to, we're going to take this thing a whole different direction. I'll just mention it here because it's an extension of what you're talking about. And I think that the people who are creating assets and creating intellectual property. I spent a lot of time in the entertainment industry. NFTs are the wave of the future of developing, and that's on blockchain technology. So technology, getting up to speed on, on what's happening in blockchain and NFTs, that definitely is going to be an opportunity for people, especially young folks, if they're listening in, that's a place for them to make a huge impact for the, for the long haul. So I think that that's, that's great. I know we can probably get into that. I want to, I want to say one thing, Going back to, to the original thing that uh, I won't call him Dr. Richardson too now, um, that uh, Dr. Richardson said was uh, some of the challenges that we have, and and Heather and Vaughn, I don't know if you guys can speak to this or not, but the challenge that most folks have when it comes to saving, this is what we find, right? By the way, yes, pay yourself first. Yes, spend, save first, spend second. We generally say, well, I'm going to just spend and then I'll say whatever's left over. We say save first, spend whatever's left over. Um, that's Warren Buffett's philosophy. But the challenge that most people have when it comes to savings is that the banks and the banking system in this country at the moment are not rewarding you for saving. So when you're putting your money in a savings account, bank rates, if you look at bank rates, uh, valuation of the average interest uh, that a bank is paying on a savings account is 0.04%. Now, there are a couple of us that are on this on this in this barbershop that are old enough to remember when you can get 12, 13, 14% on a CD. And now you're lucky if you can get 1%. So the banking system in this country, and I have a very strong opinion about it, which I'll try to contain, um, is the banking system is working against the average American family. Because if you put your money on a credit card, your average interest rate on a credit card is 18%. So if you borrow money from the same bank where you're making a deposit, they're paying you 0.04% and they're charging you 18% to borrow that same money. That's the biggest problem that we have in most, in most um, communities right now. And the challenge that most people have when it comes to saving money. And so we've got to find, and by the way, you can save in, an, in a mutual fund and in the stock market, and then, then you've got volatility. 
that you've got, you know, you've got the, the fluctuation in the market. We're right now living in this amazing time when the market has been exploding, but the market is going to have a correction just because the market does that. It has a correction. So if you can withstand the, you know, the roller coaster ride of the market, that's one thing. But you're going to have volatility in the stock market. Real estate, sometimes you don't have liquidity. You also have a bubble. Like there's a lot of challenges that come with it. We have to change systemically some of the things that are going on in the country that encourage people to save and look at where they're saving their money to be able to hit their goals, which all goes back to the very first thing that Derek said is we try to find what's our goal, what's our short-term, mid-term, long-term goal, and then what are the kinds of financial products that we can put in place to help accomplish those goals and you're going to have different, you know, different opportunities and different vehicles to choose from. But the biggest challenge I think right now is today it's the banking system. And I hate to say this, but tomorrow it's going to be the tax implication because of all the new, all the new uh, money that we've been printing over the last 20 months, all the new debt and deficit increases that have, that have occurred all point to higher taxes in the future. So we've got two things kind of working against the average American family when it comes to saving, which is how do we get the best interest rates we can on our money? And how do we avoid paying taxes, you know, more taxes than we have? Unfortunately, the average American family bears the biggest burden of the tax of the taxes in this country. And that's something that we're working on trying to help people shift their focus. I realize I threw a whole bunch in there, but I'll stop at this point. And just uh, back up a little bit to what Brian said. Um, Something that we've been advising people for years um, is that you actually cannot save your way to wealth. You have to take risk, right? And there's, there's, there's no way to just put enough money aside and hope that it'll grow by itself. The days of, as Brian said, 10 and 12 and 14% interest, um, relatively low risk uh, is gone, right? And, and that, and, and it's, it's likely not coming back, right? So, um, you know, if you want to put money aside, you first have to have that money, right, to put aside, and then grow it the best way you can. Very often, um, you know, your your return on, on investment is, is, is better served, but I always say, like, I'll, I'll manage my own money, right? Like, rather than give it to a, a a mutual fund manager who's going to, if he's very good, will over the course of 20 years, average me 11% maybe, right? So, but if I am interested in local industries and businesses that I really understand, I can do much, much better than that myself now, right? And, and you know, um, so what, what does that mean? It can mean, um, I have a, a few young people that I coach that are really into comic books and they know comic books, right? And there was a comic convention in town recently and I'm walking around with a couple of these guys and he said, you know, I have that book at home and this guy's asking $500 for that comic book, first appearance of some character. I said, well, what did you pay for it? I don't know, $2, right? I said, well, there's a market there. Right. Like if you understand comic books and you know what books are worth and you can do a little research, you can double your money right here in this convention. Like so he, we, we, as an experiment, we walked around and found one guy at the back end of the hall selling a book for ten dollars, another guy selling it for one hundred dollars at the front end of the hall. And he bought it for ten and sold it for 60 to that guy. Right. And, and, you know, took turn $10 into $60 in a few minutes, right? Now, I mean, that's uncommon, but it's possible, right? If you understand the market and you understand the things that you're interested in. The same thing can happen with real estate, right? It can happen with houses. I had another young man who um, has been a friend for a long time, someone I used to coach, who his father left him some money when he passed. He said, all right, look, I got $30,000. Um, I know you guys buy and sell houses. What can I do with $30,000? I said, well, let's look around. And to make a long story short, you know, we found a property that needed work. It didn't need much structural work. We have strong, healthy people in the community who are willing to pitch in. And, you know, they bought a house for a hundred, did the work on it. They, a couple of guys got together. They took a small private loan for the money they didn't have. And they turned 100 into 200 in six months, right? 
So, but, but you have, now, of course, there's a risk, right? Like, you know, there was a plumbing problem, set them back. They needed, luckily, we knew a guy who helped with the plumbing. There was an electric problem, set them back. But if you understand it, it's not so overwhelming, right? Like, if you know, um, look, you know, I don't have to go retail for the plumbing and get a $10,000 quote. My friend can do it for 1800 bucks. I mean, figure out how things work that you understand locally, and you might do better with your money that way. All right, I got I got to jump in and <clears throat> and kind of turn the table and look at the other side of the coin. I want to talk about what a normal, average, everyday, uh, no super skill human being can do. I can't can't write, can't sing, can't read music, don't know how to build houses. I'm just a normal guy. What I can't read the future. I don't know how to invest in. I can't predict what companies are going to, I'm just a normal guy or gal. What can I do? The simplest thing you can do to be wealthy without risk, it's mathematical. You can't break it. As long as you stay the course is own your own house. Now, let me be clear. And a bunch of people can argue with me, but I've been doing this for 34 years. If you can rent you can own your own house. I remember back in the 70s, in the 80s, I bought a house and I had to put 20% down plus closing costs. People think that's what it takes to buy a house. That's mythology. It doesn't. It's 3%. It's free if you're a veteran, but it's 3%. For those of us who are math challenged, let me explain it. If you want to buy a $200,000 house, 3% of $200,000 is $6,000. What that means in layman's terms is if you can afford first month's rent, last month's rent and security deposit, you could buy a house instead of rent. If you own your house, you make money seven ways. Seven. First of all, rent goes up, mortgage does not. Secondly, when interest rates drop like they are today, you can refinance and get a lower payment. You'll save on income taxes because most of what you pay on your house is tax deductible. You build equity with every payment because houses go up in value. But let me give you my favorite. It's, it's, it's wealth building, home ownership, item number seven. If you and your, and your brother graduate high school or college, whatever it is, you both go find a place to live for $2,000 a month or that, whatever the number is, and you buy and your brother rents, Forget the fact that every year his rent might go up, but if you buy on a 15-year mortgage, age 22, at age 37, you're rent-free for the rest of your life. Your brother's still paying $2,000 a month. That's $24,000 a year. At age 37, you don't have to pay that for the rest of your life. If you live from 27 to age 87, that's 50 years. 50 years times not having to pay $24,000 is $1.2 million. Doesn't matter if stocks go up, doesn't matter if they go down, doesn't matter if home prices go up, doesn't matter if they go down. You are rent free for the next 50 years. If it's mathematical, just make your payments for 15 years and nobody can undo that. Doesn't take any special talents, doesn't take any vision. The deal is you have to live someplace. And for the same money that you're paying the rent, you can own. And let me be clear. People say, well, you got to do maintenance on your own. Sure you do. But I get tax benefits and my rent doesn't go up either. It offsets itself. It cannot be touched. Buy a house, put a 15-year mortgage, don't refinance it. And 15 years later, you're rent-free for the rest of your life. It's unstoppable. That's the first thing you can do for yourself. And I, I can add to that because I think if we go back and we look at this historical, Mike, many of people of color, African-Americans who were free from bondage, when they did have the opportunity to make an investment, it definitely was not in the financial markets. It was in the ownership of property which that can also be passed down, which can create generational wealth. So I think that those things are important. I think what, what Nina said, as well as what Andrew said, 
Andrew's portion of, uh, or Nina's portion of building your team is extremely important. So that, that being said, and Andrew talked about this, if you do acquire that property or you acquire properties in which you plan to uh, um, uh, rent, you now have to put together a team. So that comes down back to what I started off talking about, which are the relationships that can assist you with fixing the plumbing or putting up drywall or doing landscaping. So that's your team that Nina talked about. The other piece of this that Eric just said, that first home you buy, you may, that may, that's your baby, that's your first home. You may now want to upgrade because maybe you've decided to expand your family. You went from yourself or you, you and your wife to now you're having three kids, you need more space. Guess what? This is how the wealth is built as well. You can keep that home. Matter of fact, that home can help you buy the, the, your second home with more space. So you can take equity out of that home to buy the other home, keep that home and rent it out. So now you're, you're getting paid to manage that property and live in your, your new home with your family with more space. So there's so many things that can, and, and as, as Eric said, you don't need any sp particular special skill to do that. You just need to start off with what we all talked about, which is having the discipline to understand that there are options and decisions that you can make that can be life changing. So that's that's what I would add to it. I, I want to speak to something that's that's being said right now. Y'all know when Dr. Richardson and Dale start speaking, I get really, really excited. So um, a couple of thoughts that came to mind was one, definitely the default of knowing that um, you can always start off with property. And then what I heard from Nina, just monetizing, monet and Andrew, monetizing your, your talents and your interest to like begin to acquire wealth, right? Uh, one of the things that I found very interesting was what uh, I want to say, I hope I said it right, Devon said, which is meeting somebody where they are. When I first got into this wealth journey, right? I, it was a journey because what it looked like five years ago versus now, totally different. I got supercharged and excited and I took all that information and I ran to my daughter. I said, we're going to be wealthy. I'm going to make you super rich. You're, we're going to change this generational gap. And this is how we're going to invest money with IRAs. And she looked at me like I lost my mind and I couldn't talk to her about wealth. But what she did want to talk about was cryptocurrency. What she did want to talk about was different areas. And I learned and realized that um, whether it was my own family or friends, they were in different places uh, that that of that money had different interests to them. It felt different. It had a different psyche to them. And so because in this platform, we're talking to 12 year olds, 22 year olds, 32 year olds, 42 year olds and 52 year olds. How do we speak to everybody across the platform? So maybe I'm not at that stage where I'm going to put money in property, but I saved up and I still don't know what to do with this thousand dollars. And if I don't figure something out, I know I'm going to waste it. Right. Um, maybe I'm at that place where I have a talent but I don't really know how to flip that and turn it to something that is generational changing as relates to my wealth. How do we speak to people across the platform yeah. in that space? Cause I, I just got out of debt. That's what was in the first series. So this is a horrible plug for anyone who didn't see how to get out of debt, go check out the other series. Now I got, I got two quarters. I'm excited and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Right. Maybe I got talent. Um, and maybe my talent looks a little bit different. What am I supposed to do with this thing? You know, so yeah. I, I guess that's the question I want to ask across the board. Well, I would say that, again, it's important. I always love, I love that I came up with this. Personal finance is personal. So it, it, there is not one size fits all for everyone. Fortunately, if you're 14, you're going to be in a different place from someone who's 37 with kids and, uh, and, less time and toddlers, right? So you cannot have this one size fits all solution. And again, my interest, I want to be sipping a real espresso in San Tropez, right? Whatever Brian said, I'm like, sign me up for that, you know? <laughs> right. But for other people, they may just be fine with, you know, uh, <laughs> And I want to push back on Eric a little bit, like not reading or writing. I'm like, I think I think we got to raise the bar for what normal is <laughs> in terms of like, I think you should be able to to read and write. I think that's a, that'll open up more opportunities for sure. Um, but it, it, it varies. But I think at the basic level, we need to help people understand the game. I am I am, uh, you know, 
I don't, this may upset people, but I'm absolutely a capitalist. I think that capitalism can be done well. And I think it's important. Yes, I, I would never tell anybody to wait for reparations. As much as I acknowledge what has happened in the past, don't. Oh, you, don't wait. Nina, we love we we'll your audio. Come back. We want to hear you. Oh, <laughs> your audio went out. Can you hear me? Can you it come know, back? I think that was. I think that was that uh, okay. was in the court chief. So, yeah, right. Yeah, I never. Tried to censor you, but come through. Come through. <laughs> I said, I mean, you are talking to a graduate of the Howard University. I, uh, you know, grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, you know, like uh, worked in corporate. Like, I, I understand I've been in different worlds, um, but I think I'm just very practical and I'm very, again, solution oriented. So I'm a bit impatient when it comes to policy being enacted. And so as much as it's important to to push for the policies you want to see enacted in local government, federal government, when it comes to building wealth, time really is money, and you you want to see things move forward in a swift way because your children's children's future is depending on it. And so we do have to teach young people the game that we currently live in, the game that has not changed for centuries. And so we need to understand the money game at the very basic level, which it's, it blow. I mean, I somewhat understanding, but it blows my mind that, you know, we do not teach about inflation or taxes or tax deductible, you know, like understanding that you need to understand EBITDA, right? You need to understand how can I lower my taxable income? What does that even mean? Why do I not just want to invest, but why do I need to invest so that I can beat inflation? You know, why do I need to understand maybe at its basics how to read a balance sheet or get a friend who knows how to read a balance sheet or get a good accountant and a good lawyer so I can understand pass throughs because that's just the game. Don't hate the play, hate the game. Like that's the game currently that we're in. And I, I play basketball, so I look at things. We have to foundationally, I would say, whether someone's 14 or 37, they need to understand the fundamentals of the money game that we live in. And that's from there, you can more better tailor it to their position. If they're a point guard that just got out of debt, that is ready to invest or a power forward, you know, that's that's ready to buy a home, then you can tailor it. But at the foundation, everyone needs to understand the money game and the basic vocabulary so that they can start playing it and not waiting around for policies to change. So, so I, can we give a bounce pass to Heather? You yeah, know, I got some. I'm 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 gonna tee up Heather real quick. I'm gonna tee up Heather. I'm gonna take something that Nina said. So, Nina, you talk about them learning the game. So, what happens? Uh, if you don't trust the game, right? So like a lot of people don't trust the banks. A lot of people don't trust these places, right? I know, um, Heather, you put something mm -hmm. amazing in there that I think needs to be said. So um, being that you can move markets, I say that lovingly, right? Um, what happens if I don't trust it? What happens if I don't trust the game? How do, how do you get people to, to trust the game? In other words, understand it so they could play it better, so they can have confidence when they actually go in the game. Well, and I do want to make clear, we, Devon and I do not move markets, but <laughs> that's exactly what we were trying to say. Please, please don't take what we say and move markets. <laughs> but um, yeah, oh. no, I, I think it's a bit, I mean, I don't mean to, you know, sort of belittle the point at all. I mean, absolutely. You know, there's, there are trust issues and I think they're founded, you know, I mean, that's, that's there. And I, I think Nena and the work that organizations like hers do is so important, you know, because you do have to learn that game. You need to um, work with what you have at the moment. And I think there are opportunities to do that. So, I mean, now I can tell you, you know, there are rules out there that banks are supposed to follow. And, you know, there are agencies and organizations that want to hear about it if they're not following those rules, you know, and so understand that trust can be damaged, you know, and that there are opportunities to repair it. But I would say if the trust is going so far that, or, or trust issues are going so far, you know, that you're not engaging in the conversation, that you're not engaging your kids in the conversation. And what I wanted to piggyback on what Nena was saying with the team is make your kids part of that conversation. We all have a lot of stress about money. It's scary. A lot of people don't want to talk about it. You know, it's not always fun. And especially if it's keeping you up at night, but talk to kids about it because they learn from 
how you work and what you talk about. And if you're afraid of it, they're going to be afraid of it. You know, if, if you get a kid started, you know, early enough, sort of talking about those dreams, you know, there are so many opportunities to help support those dreams, you know, and in whether you own a home or not, right. But any kind of asset, any kind of saving, that's something that you can then leverage not only for yourself, not only to pay yourself right first, but also pay it forward and make sure and, and really help your kids. Maybe, I mean, I know I've made a lot of mistakes that I really, really hope my kids don't repeat. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, by leading by example and talking about those things, I can help them. And I, one plug I want to throw in there, and I'm sure we're going to talk more about intergenerational is, um, is basically this idea that it's never too early for kids to start saving. But when I talk about saving, I mean, in a broader sense, if your kid has a job with a paycheck, a part-time job, they can start an IRA. You can help them start a custodial IRA. And then that time value of money is completely on their side. You know, so that's, that's just an idea I throw out there, um, you know, obviously without being able to go too far into all the details right now, but just those nuggets, those ideas, not having kids be afraid of money, talking to them about it, talking about those wants and needs and delayed gratification. And the final plug I'm going to make on behalf of economic educators everywhere, and I think Professor Favors would back me up, is encourage your kids to take economics in school when it's offered. Please, please do. You know, we need them. We need them to be part of the, that conversation. We need more kids studying economics so that we can diversify, you know, economics as well. So those well, are, those are my this. plugs. I'm actually- <laughs> Something that Jerry said, um, I think is important when he talked about trust. I think we have to be honest and acknowledge, and I think Brian hinted at this as well, and, and so did Nana. The game is not fair, right? It's not. And it is, it is especially not fair for people of color and women and minorities. There was a story, it was a national story, but it happens a lot. I'm, I'm in the field, I see it um, in Florida recently where a mixed race couple was selling a house. When the appraiser came to appraise the house, the wife who was black was home. He showed her around the house. The appraisal came in $300,000 lower than the contract price. She had a feeling she got from this guy when he was walking around the house about what was really going on here. This happened in Jacksonville. So she went around the house, took down all the pictures of the family that showed black people, took down all the African art. When the house was showed again, her husband, who was white, showed the house. The house appraised for contract value, right? It, this, this is a difference in generational wealth of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a three week period because of who showed the house, okay? It's not fair. So when we talk about policy, like not waiting for policy, I agree, policy change is slow, but this should be illegal, right? And you need to uh, lean on your local government officials and politicians, tell them, I read this story, this is garbage, This has been happening to my parents and grandparents for generations. And that's why generational wealth is so hard to build for people in our community. So I think understanding that and even being mad about it is important because you got to know how to fix it, get out there and do something about it. You can work as hard as you want, but my grandfather's house was not worth what his neighbor's house was worth because of the color of his skin. I just want to add, because this is an issue that I'm very passionate about, you know, there, when we talk about home ownership, we can't talk about that without recognizing just everything Andrew just said. There's a long, long history of housing discrimination, redlining, racial covenants, denying Black people and ethnic minorities from financing. Um, that really plays a role in home ownership, home ownership today. And even when uh, people of color do buy into home ownership, we've seen them lose a lot of the value of, for example, the 2008 recession. That's always on the back of my mind. Uh, Black families lost about half of their wealth. Uh, his Latino families lost about 67% of their wealth. And we're just now getting back that wealth today. Um, so home ownership, yes, is one of the most vital assets to building wealth. 
I don't think it is the only asset, definitely not the sole asset. Um, and in, in order for a household, especially a household of color, to be secure and to build wealth and have less risk, I do think that there needs to be a diversification. Like Heather said, you know, investing in your children, uh, retirement, children's savings accounts, or NFTs. I don't know too much about those, but I keep hearing the word. So I just wanted to, to add that little tidbit. Well, Devon, I think you guys do a great job at the Fed of providing education in the first place because you you encourage schools to come and visit the Fed and understand the process of of how money is handled and dealt with. So you're creating comfort levels with that. Isn't that right? Yep, that's the goal for sure. So so question, I actually going to throw this to um, Dale. I'm throwing that up real quick because after that, I want to circle back to Eric. Right now, I'm working with my mom. She's going to her twilight. She's about to retire. And in that space, she said, hey, help me get my stuff in order, Social Security, everything else. She literally takes out a bag, uh, literally a plastic bag with a bunch of envelopes and cards and say, like, we need you to help me call these people so we can figure this stuff out. So all these years, she knows she's supposed to get it, what that's supposed to look like, how that works out. And I went through months of trying to help organize it. How early can you actually start to prepare for um, IRA, retirement, for, um, 457, 401k? What does that even mean? That just sounds like a lot of numbers to a lot of people. Yeah. But like, when do you even start? I'm starting from the eight ball with my mom and that told me to get my own affairs in order. But in general, like, what's the, what's the barometer? Because we know how we're talking to youth, which I want to circle back with Eric, but... What does that look like just starting in advance to make sure the longevity of your, of your life and sustainability of your wealth is there in the long run? I think what you have to do is get comfortable with exposing your details to family and find an advisor early. So I began that process as a young person and I took on an advisor in my, well, I was an advisor at one point, and then I took on an advisor uh, when, I, when I was about 28. Why? Because I felt that I knew what I was doing, but I wanted to make sure I was not missing anything. Now, when I, I smiled because I have dealt with the bag with all the documents in it with my mother and with my mother-in-law. And uh, we have it provided them with advisors as well. Because again, if you think about, and I think, Devon talked about, uh, not all, but many people of color, the, the, not all, again, don't let me put this as all, but many, they secured jobs that were good government jobs or good jobs with, pen, jobs, jobs with good pensions. So they knew that they had this defined benefit plan that was going to provide them with retirement assets. And so they may not have made the other investments necessary. Brian brought up the point of life insurance, which is another investment vehicle. Brian Andrew talked about risk taking. Risk taking is simple. You take a risk every time you walk out your door and walk down the sidewalk. Someone could drive their car on the sidewalk from losing control and hit you. So it's a risk we take every day. So if you understand that your job is to manage risk, which is manage your life, part of that is managing the assets that are going to come to you in a defined benefit plan. Or you could decide that you need to, uh, you may change companies and now you work at a company that doesn't have a pension, but has a 401k plan, which is a defined contribution plan. That is a plan in which you have the option of putting as much money up, uh, uh, putting money up to a certain point, tax, pre-tax into that. And it defines the amount you can put in, but it doesn't define how much you can make. The, what you make is all about, again, back to Andrew, how much risk you're willing to take, what investments should you put into those. And so that's what we need to educate each other on what those items are. And then also make sure that we understand how to best manage the risk of our life with life insurance, with other forms of protective assets, a, a rainy day fund, as you talked about, putting those in, maybe you have real estate. So now what happens is you have a overall portfolio of investment assets that are diversified. So even if the market goes down, but housing is up, you still made money. Even if 
your your 401k is down in certain areas, but the other areas that you chose as investment vehicles in that 401k are up and so on and so forth. So we need to better understand risk and risk taking. We need to better understand how to build a portfolio that is diversified. And we need to better understand the vehicles that are available to us to do these things. And that's why you need to have a Derek and a Brian in your life to help guide you through every step of your life. And so if you watch television and we talked about being consumers, this is my last point, uh, is we watch the, 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 you can watch a Merrill Lynch commercial in which they have an advisor who's sitting with a family or maybe he's, I think this one, he's at um, a, a graduation of a young lady and it's his client's daughter. And he's talking about when that client's daughter was born, when that client's daughter went to college, and now that client's daughter is getting married. And he's been there every step of the way with his client. That right there is what we need to, if we could add anything to any of our family, especially people of color, it's making sure that we have trusted advisors that can help us guide our way through different parts of life and be a point of discussion and guidance throughout the process. So that's what I would tell you. Dale, there's so much, so much there that you like went into. Like, I can't even tell you how deep we could take this at this point. You talked about diversification. We've talked about motivation. We talk about financial planners, but you have to own your finances. Like the financial planner is not going to be any magic solution. All the decisions you make are going to be for yourself. You talked about different products. You talked about pensions. Um, you know, if you look at someone's typical finances for being able to handle those big life events that you mentioned, right? Like getting married, having children, there's not that many of them, right? Um, go, trying to send your kids to college, getting ready for your own retirement, helping your parents when they need help and, and um, they can't help themselves later in life, in, later in your life, right? There are these, these big financial events that are going to happen into your life. And the sooner you get started on that, as Heather was saying, the better. Um, I don't know if I don't have it queued up, but we often talk about the rule of 72 as far as being able to start early and what impact that makes. Um, I don't have a visual to more powerful with a visual, but, um, you know, it's, it's a formula that um, um, Einstein came up with, believe it or not, <laughs> not his most famous, famous formula, but it basically says if you have, uh, if you're earning an interest rate on a certain, at a certain interest rate, if you take 72, divide by that interest rate. So let's say it's 4%. Um, I'm just gonna look, look here to kind of go through. If you have an investment that makes 4%, um, your money will double uh, every 18 years, right? So in the, in the course of your life, you stand to, to maybe have your, your money double twice, three times, right? Let's go to the other end of it. If your interest rate on the other side that you're earning is 12%, you stand to double your, your wealth every six years. So you stand to double your wealth, um, and this is off of a $10,000 investment, you stand to double your wealth um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times by the age of 65. Um, so that kind of gets a little bit to why starting early is nice if you can, but listen, starting at any time is better than no time. Um, just like Jerry's mom. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add some more stuff, Brian. Well, I think what you have is Eric has a video that he wants to share because it, okay. it tells it just the importance of educating the next generation. And I think you could see a Devon and Anita are very passionate about making sure that people know the importance of understanding money and understanding finance. And I tell you guys, this is a special group to be a part of. Thank you for having me. I need to jump and take my son who is an econ major um, to an event at his college Morehouse. So I see you guys, but thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale. DD, before we take- Yes, Morehouse man. We need more Morehouse men, that's great. <laughs> 
Hey, and fam, you right here. So <laughs> that's all for you. It's okay. We don't all get the blessing of going to Howard, but it, it's, it's okay. It'll suffice. We, we can talk about that. <laughs> Before we tee up the video, I just want to highlight something that's been kind of echoed by most of the people here. At the core of this thing is education. We just never learned how to play. And that's why it's generational. If your grandparents didn't know, they, did, they couldn't share it with your parents. If your parents didn't know, they couldn't share it with you. So in a minute, I've asked if we can show a video, and I'll introduce that video in a second. But basic fundamental education, many of us, many of our people, many people of color, believe that I'll be okay because I have social security. Been paying on it all my life. I don't know how many people who are listening, I don't know how many people on this panel know. Do you know what the average social security check is in this country? $1,400 a month. That's it. That's the average. The max is $3,200. You are not going to live the life you want to live on Social Security. If I knew that when I was 18, imagine my motivation to make some decisions. But if nobody told me that until I got to be uh, Mike's uh, grandmother or who's retiring or mother who's retiring, she missed all those years of motivation. It boils down to education. So I asked if we could cue it, tee up a video. And I have to tell you all, I am a, a global corporate teacher. I'm a global finance teacher. I've trained over 30,000 people, and I am really good. This guy is way better than me. This is his eight-year-old daughter. Okay. What's assets? Assets are things that bring money into your bank account. What's liabilities? Liabilities are things that take money out your bank account. Entrepreneurship is the act of becoming an entrepreneur. What's entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is a process of setting up a business or business. Taking on a greater than normal. Financial risk. What's an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur is a person that organizes and operates a business or businesses. Also taking on a greater than normal. Financial risk. What's financial mean? Money. And what's risk mean? Chance. Come on. What does it mean to own stock? When you own a share of a company. Come on. What's real estate investing? Real estate investing is when you invest in an immovable property. What's the two types of real estates? Commercial real estate and residential real estate. What's commercial real estate? Commercial real estate is property for businesses and workspace, like an office store and land. And what's residential real estate? Property to live on, like a house, apartment, or condominium. Come on. It comes with extra fees when you have real estate, you feel me? Mm -hmm. Daddy tells you how many times he pays his per, uh, state property tax a year. Once a year. What's, what's the type of maintenance fee? Cutting grass. Come on. What's HOA? Homeowner Association. And what comes along with that? HOA fee. Come on. And when it comes to the brokerage percent, what percent is that? Seven. Come on. What's equity? Equity is the difference between what your business is worth minus what you owe on it. Also, assets minus? Liabilities and debt. Good job. What's credit report? Credit report is like a report card letting you know how well you did by paying your money back you borrowed. And how does credit affect your life? The better you keep your credit, the more opportunities you have to get funding. And what? Large purchases like? A car or a house. Come on. And always repay what you owe. Because if you owe somebody, that means you're in. Debt. And you never want to be in. Debt. Because that means you owe somebody. And we don't never owe. Somebody. Because that ain't what suckers do. Period. Come on. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't don't tell me we can't teach our kids about finances. Drop the mic. <laughs> that was inspiring. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I was blown away when I saw that video. Don't tell me we can't teach our people yes, about money. That, that video beautiful. Scott, come on. Say something to the people, Scott. Come on. <laughs> I don't even know if I want to. I think we just need to close out right there. But I, <laughs> I know. You need that to put, awesome. put that dad and that kid in the barbershop. Oh, Woo! We have to get them them there somewhere, at least the kid, you know. <laughs> at least you can afford kid. the kid. He can be on the team. So yeah. but but I want to move to, I want to shift a little bit because it's one thing about growing debt and I mean a growing wealth and we're doing that. And my understanding, it takes like two year, two generations to gain wealth and it takes one generation to wipe it out. I want to go to Andrew because I know that all the stuff we're talking about, you gotta legalize this stuff. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about, because I know that I've talked to my lawyer, and actually I got my paperwork up here right now, and it talks about my living will. What am I going to be doing? How do I start preparing that also? And Brian, I want you to also talk about insurance, because I know that we have life insurances and we have different types of insurances that we can also help to build generational wealth also, that when we're gone, this check will be left for someone else. So uh, so I don't know, uh, maybe Brian go first and then Andrew, let's talk about how to tie it all up into a nice neat bow. Cause I know that, you know, I always think about, you know, James Brown and that they couldn't bury him because they had so many different kids and everybody got to get a piece of the estate. And if he didn't leave anything to explain where the estate goes, it just becomes a mess. So Brian, let's talk about ins life insurance stuff first. And okay. Andrew, let's talk about uh, getting it written down right. Okay, beautiful. I'll just I just wanted to to say that, you know, as 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 Dr. Richardson was talking about assets and you know, investing money in your home and having that as an asset, uh, life insurance, if if structured properly, can be another asset that you basically can utilize in exactly the same way. There's two different kinds of life insurance. One that most people know about, which is term insurance, which is fairly inexpensive. It's a low monthly premium to give you coverage. I call that death insurance because that is what pays your family when you die. The challenge is you have to die within that term or it's not, or it doesn't pay, right? So think about that, right? If you're 27 years old, you're like, all right, well, I, I just got married to have a kid, you know, have a million dollar life insurance policy that's 20 years. Well, by the time you're 46 and a half, you're going to be very, very careful. Your family's going to be like, okay, ready for you to go. You know, I joke about it, but, but honestly, the term insurance is a, is a great, is a great product to have for protection, but for wealth accumulation, a permanent policy. So let's talk about just really in general, there's a term policy and there's a perm or a permanent policy. Term lasts for a period of time. Permanent lasts your whole life. If you structure properly, now some people are confused. They go, oh, well, that's whole life. Yeah. Whole life is a version of permanent policy. There are several iterations of what a permanent policy can look like. So a permanent policy is a portion of the premium goes to pay for the insurance and another portion goes like a house and it builds equity. So a whole life policy is as if the extra money that you put in the policy is as if you bought a CD at an insurance company, flat interest rate for the most part, it pays out, it'll pay out a certain amount of money. Um, other forms of variable life insurance, that's like taking your money and putting it in the stock where it's invested in the market. And so your cash value of your life insurance will go up and down with the market. Some people don't want to lose any money in their life insurance. So there's other forms like universal life insurance or index universal life insurance. All that to say that the amount of money that sits in that cash value account, if it's structured properly, it's like equity in your home. It grows at a certain percentage. A lot of the companies that we work with, they have a floor so that the money can't go down. If the market goes down, they have a cap in the a ceiling of about 15% average about six to 10% interest on your money every year. Here's the magic. It's tax-free access. So you can like your second on your house. If you were to second on your house, which you basically take a loan out of your house, you don't pay, you don't pay tax on the loan that you take out on your house. Life insurance, if you build enough cash value, you can have access to that cash value and utilize it for purchasing a, a property, purchasing something else that has asset value. So now you're having your money work for you. If you get sick, you can build long-term care into your life insurance policy, which is a big thing right now. Long-term care for our elderly, for those who are going to become elderly in the next 20 or 30 years, that is a big deal. 70% of Americans over the age of 65 are going to require long-term care insurance. And right now, the average is about, it's about $10,000 a month to take care of an elderly person using life long-term care. So you have to have enough assets in order to do that. If you put long-term care in your life insurance, you're protected as you get sick, you know, if you get sick as you get older. The best thing is if you live a long time, you don't get sick, all that cash value is available for you to use to do other things with. Again, your access to it as cash value is, is tax-free. When you pass away, your family gets the death benefit, also income tax, income tax free. So that's a way of building generational wealth. And some people say, well, if I'm, we were talking about this, if I'm 22 years old, I'm not married, I don't have kids, I don't have a house, I don't have any assets, why would I buy life insurance? The cost of life insurance is based on your age, your gender, your health, and how you structure it. So if you're 22 years old, chances are you're in pretty good health. And the cost of your insurance is very low. You get a, you get a good rating, and that rating stays with you 
for the rest of your life. The rest of you have that ownership of that life insurance. So you can basically, you're buying a vehicle that you can put money into, put savings into, and use it like your own bank. There are many books written on, in fact, one is called Become Your Own Bank, uh, <laughs> Becoming Your Own Bank, right? There's so many books that are written on on, on zero, uh, the power of zero, which is having a zero tax retirement account for when you when you need to have access to cash. So it's the kind of thing that can supplement an IRA, a 401k, or your retirement fund. If you think about this, if you have a retirement account and you're in the market and the market drops, but you're used to, you're in retirement age, you're used to taking money out of your retirement account every year. Well, if the market drops, it's taking value out. And then you're taking money out, it's going to continue to drop. And those years, you take the money out of your life insurance, cash value, let the market recover on your retirement account. And now you actually have more wealth for the long haul. All of that goes to your beneficiaries. Life insurance goes to your beneficiaries, income tax-free. So it provides a lot of that, um, a lot of the things that we talked about, safety and security, like you want in the bank, but a better interest rate. You want it to be safe in case the market goes down and you want to have a, the impact of no taxes down the road. So it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what interest rates, it doesn't matter what tax rates are in the future. You basically have access to your money, income tax-free. So life insurance, if it's done properly, and again, if somebody would sit in and explain it to our families, we'd have a lot, there's a lot of misinformation about how life insurance is utilized and how life insurance, some people think it's costly, there's a lot of misinformation out there. But life insurance companies are considered tier one capital. It's been around, some companies have been around for over 150 years. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty staid business. Of the Fortune 100 companies, 12 of them are, are 12 of the 100 are life insurance companies, insurance companies. So really, you know, a good opportunity to look at it as a, as a again, part of your port, overall portfolio. So real estate, in, investment, in mutual funds, stocks and bonds, life insurance, that gives you a nice diversified portfolio, but you can start to save money in that. And, and by the way, there's something called a, a million dollar baby. Some people do this when their children are born. They, can, they start to contribute a hundred dollars a month. And by the time that child is 18, they take, there's enough money there to take out to start to pay for college. By the time they turn 35, there's enough money in their cash value to pay for their down payment on their house. And by the time they're 65, another couple million dollars available to them, income tax-free, all by starting it when they're very young because of the compound interest and the rule of 72, as, as Derek was talking about. The compound interest, by the way, I'll just say this last thing about, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, but the rule of 72 uh, has actually been around since the days of land ownership and Aristotle, believe it or not. The fact that Einstein is credited with it is because Einstein popularized it. Einstein was big into the theories, into formulas and the formulaic equations. And so his theory of his theory of relativity is we all know you can ask all of your kids that you that you that you talk about in your educational programs what's the, what's the theory of relativity e equals i have to say is e equals and most will say mc squared and they have no real concept of what that means but if you ask them what the rule of 72 is which you can see is how your money doubles nobody understands what that rule of 72 is that's what einstein called it the theory of money and how we build compound interest and how we build wealth and again going back to credit card interest, if you're paying 18% in credit card interest, 18 and 72 means your debt doubles in four years. At 0.04% interest in a savings account, your interest at a Wells Fargo will double in 1,800 years in a savings account while your debt doubles in four. That's the challenge that we have in this country and in our systems. And so that's why we want to flip it and give all of our people the idea if they understand the rule of 72 and how compound interest works, as Warren Buffett says, if you understand how compound interest works, you'll be wealthy. And if you don't, you'll be poor because if you know it, you'll earn it. And if you don't, you'll pay it. So rule of 72 is one of those critical educational formulas everybody should know about. We apply it with life insurance. It's just compound interest. It's something for the long haul. So that's my pitch in that. And that's what we do. We want to educate people about how these things work for their future. All right. Yeah. Can we, can we maybe try to find the rule of 72 and show it to? Yeah, you know what? I have it here. If I, if, I don't know. I can't really share my screen. I have okay, a... Uh, if you send it to Dave, he can share it. All right. I'll send it to Dave. It's a... It's a... It's a uh, I don't know how... To, uh, it's 72 divided by your interest rate equals the number of years to double. It's not complicated. <laughs> and, but what I like that Brian pointed out, it, it works against you the other way too. In, in, in the way that I explain it, which is I use layman's terms because... That's just how I do. But in layman's terms, if you have a $2,000 balance on a credit card, 
at 24% interest. It will take you 22 years to pay that off if you never charge another dime and you'll pay $8,400 in interest on that $2,000 loan. That's what the rule of 72 does for debt. It's kind of dark, but I, I, I see it. Uh... I don't know, Brian, you want to explain this? What we're yes, there it is. Yeah, so here, here's an example. So if you look at the, uh, whoops, where'd it go? Who, who's here? There we go. At 4% interest, so 72 divided by four. I'll, I'll explain what those numbers are. That tells you that your money will double in every, every 18 years. So we use this as an example. We say if you're 29 years old and you had $10,000 and you put it into a, into a four, into a four, uh, uh, some sort of interest-bearing account that earns you 4% interest, in 18 years, that 10,000 would become 20. Now this doesn't take taxes into consideration. This is just straight formulaic. And then by the time you're 65, you're gonna get another double. So that $10,000 will double a couple of times. If we go far to the right, if you earn 12% interest, 72 divided by 12 is six. That means your money will double in six years. So if you say, take that same $10,000 at age 29, well, you're getting one, two, three, four, five, six doubles by the time you're of retirement age. That's, and that's why wealthy people think about money in terms of percentages. If you ask a wealthy person how they do in the market, they're going to say, well, I made 10. We mentioned it earlier. I can pay, Andrew said, if I can get 11% in a mutual fund, I'm good. Well, if you, you get 12%, that means that your interest is, that your, your principal theoretically is doubling every six years. So if that's why you want to start thinking about any, you can walk away with this formula. 72 divided by the interest rate gives you the number of years for your money to double. You want to have your money get as many doubles in your lifetime as you possibly can. So I'd much rather see our debt down here on the left side or even further down to zero and our savings towards the right, eight, six, eight, 10, 12% interest. So that's really the rule of 72. Thanks, uh, Derek, if you put that up there. Thank, thanks for putting that. But that hopefully gives you a, kind of a, an idea. Awesome, that awesome, awesome. Uh, and now, so, so uh, Andrew, uh, we got to get all this legal paperwork together. And, you know, because we don't want people fighting about it and make sure, you know, uh, everybody gets what they want to get. And um, so um, I know, I, like, I, I'm already working on my living will. I still got some, some things to add in there. Uh, can you, is that the right way to going or is it something better that we can legally take in and that we're, we're tying it up and making it official? I think that um, there's a couple of different ways to approach it. Again, this is sort of uh, specific to different states have different rules on interstate successorship and who gets what after you die in the absence of a will or who can challenge a will this sort of thing. I don't want to really get into the weeds and the details, but I think it's extremely important to get your ducks in a row. And what that generally means from a legal standpoint is having an idea of what you want to happen with your assets and your wealth and thinking about whether or not that is going to happen. So for example, I represented uh, a family many years ago who came to me on the sudden death of the husband. Um, the kids were grown, there was some assets. The main asset was a, a, a house without a mortgage on it. And I said, well, you know, your, your mom's gonna get that. Uh, and the, uh, the mom said, can I talk to you afterwards for a minute? And I said, sure. And uh, when everyone left, she said, we were never really married. And I said, oh, well, you know, that changes things, right? Everyone assumed that they're old people who lived together for so long and had kids and grandkids that they were legally married. Now we have to get into conversations about common law marriage and whether the, the state recognizes that and to what extent, and it's a whole Megillah, right? Whereas all they had to do was run down to the courthouse, spend the afternoon and sign a piece of paper, right? And she would have gotten everything, right? So, you know, get your ducks in a row figure out what you want to happen and, and is that going to happen? Um, you know, sometimes the easiest thing to do is not go through the whole business of uh, having a, a written will and then filing it with the local courthouse and having the will probated upon your death and the expense of all that. If really the assets are simple assets, a house, a bank account, um, 
and the successors are one or two kids, just add them to the account now. You know what I mean? They'll, if, if you trust them and they're not idiots uh, and they're adults, add them to the deed now, right? So that when you die, you don't have to go through all this will business. They automatically get the house. They're already on the deed. They're, just think about what you want done and figure out if that's going to happen. And, and I think that's something that not enough people do. Certainly in my experience as an attorney um, for 30 years, I've seen it many, many times where people just assumed things would take care of themselves. They worked really hard on making money. They didn't figure out what was going to happen to it and, and, and the various rules. They didn't understand that if when they retired to Florida and they now establish a domicile in Florida and they came from New York, the rules are different in Florida. Look into that too. You, you know what I mean? So yeah, I think it's a hugely important question. It, it, you know, lawyers spend their entire career studying and working on this sort of thing. Um, but on, on, you know, as a simple concept, you definitely need to figure out what you want done with your assets, um, what kind of assets you have, um, and what happens if you die right now, who gets what? That, that is so important, the spending side that sometimes we don't talk about because we haven't had much experience with it. I saw a video a couple weeks ago uh, that's popular on the internet right now where Shaq talked about how he spent a million dollars in a day. He, he, went, he, he said he got a million dollar bonus, so he went and bought himself a big black Mercedes, got home and his dad said, where's mine? So he went back, bought an identical one for his dad and his mom said, well, I can't drive that, I need to support you. And then his attorney, his, uh, attorney called him and said, you just spent a million dollars. He said, how'd I do that? He said, well, you spent 600,000 on three cars and you paid and FICA took the rest. And Shaq, Shaq said, FICA, I don't know no debt blame FICA because <laughs> he didn't know about FICA. I'll share this story with you. I had a friend, a close friend of mine who recently died. He had a beautiful half million dollar estate in St. Louis, Missouri, and left that to his two sons along with enough stock that it was about a million dollars worth of wealth to distribute. And the oldest son, in, in the sense of wanting to uh, honor his father, wanted to keep the house, and he would have gone through the, his inheritance in a year trying to hold on to that house. They did, we sat, we all sat down together, talked through some options. What they actually did, each son took his part of the inheritance and bought a house cash, just paid it off. And now they're each rent free for the rest of their lives, which means they can do anything. One son said, well, I'm not sure I wanna pay a house cash because I have all these debts that I'm carrying, I wanna pay off my debts. And we talked about it and he realized if I don't have a rent payment because he's paying $2,800 a month for rent, you can pay a lot of debt off real fast with $2,800 a month. But that whole conversation had never taken place until after my friend had died. So no, Andrew, you're right. We don't talk about that. And some of those things are so simple if you do them ahead of time. And that's, that's not our... That's not our experience base of the people that we're trying to help. It really can come down to something really basic on the life insurance side, right? It's about beneficiaries um, and keeping those up to date. Um, I've heard stories of people who have <clears throat> divorced, remarried, and their life insurance goes to the original spouse, if you can believe that. Um, and then just along the lines of what Andrew was saying about getting everything in order, if that's what you choose to do, I don't know if you've followed what's going on with Prince and his probate and estate, but they've been in court for quite some time. So, which, which, you know, is not what Prince intended. Same with Aretha Franklin, James Gandolfini, Chadwick Boseman, the list goes on of people who didn't have their paperwork in order. And the one thing that COVID has well, one of the many things that COVID has, uh, has exposed is our lack of preparation for a long-term illness, uh, disability, and the possibility of somebody dying. There are almost 3 million GoFundMe accounts for funeral wow. services. And that's, that's not the way to... By the way, here's the other thing that people don't realize. If you get, if you get money on a, fund me, on a fund me account, you have to pay taxes on that money you receive. 
People don't realize that too. So, you know, that's not the solution. The solution is not to wait until something severe happens to your family. You want to have those conversations now and be in preparation. Money seems to be a taboo conversation in this country, and it shouldn't be. It should be an open conversation like that father and his eight-year-old daughter. Talk about money now with whoever you are. Now is always the best time to start preparing for not only the unforeseen, but for what you want to have your dreams come true. The end is coming for all of us at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So be prepared and make sure that your family is, is up to date on everything that you've got laid out. It's Ryan, you, men you mentioned paying taxes on the GoFundMe campaign. Can we talk a little bit more about paying taxes generally? So what are a few uh, anchoring principles or, or ideas when we're thinking about 2021 and, and a new approach to or a smarter approach to, to paying taxes? Because the government's going to get theirs, but how can we be smarter about what that exactly is? There's, there's three things you have to know about taxes. The good news is it's not 800, although the tax law has thousands of items. But the three things you need to know, you need to know the difference between an adjustment and a deduction. Most people don't know the difference. The reason, reason that's important, if I have deductions like interest on uh, my home that I pay and things like that, when you calculate whether your standard deduction or your itemized deductions are bigger, frequently that standard deduction is gonna be bigger because the IRS just wanted to reduce the burden of doing taxes. But adjustments are deductions that are in addition. They're outside of the standard deduction. Even if you take a standard deduction, an adjustment like alimony you pay is extra. You need to understand that. The second is you need to understand how the tax rate tables work. It's real simple. You can pay as a, uh, the, the lowest rate is paid by married couples filing jointly. The next lowest rate is paid by head of household where you are responsible for a household with other people. And the highest rate is paid by an individual. If you don't know that and you're an individual and you're divorced, but you're taking care of your kids, the difference between filing as single versus filing a, as head of household is a lot of money. The third thing you need to know is what a credit is. Tax credit is not a deduction. If I have a $2,000 deduction and I'm in a 10% tax bracket, that's going to save me 20 bucks. But if I have a $2,000 credit, that's going to save me $2,000 off what I owe to, to the IRS. Here's something that most people don't know. It is very possible, not, not rare, very possible that with tax credits that you qualify for, it is possible to get more money back from the IRS than you paid in. And so if you don't know what the five or six or seven most popular tax credits are, you, you just, and th this is every year, you're just throwing money away. Rich people know those three things about taxes. Well, and I would say to add to that is that is that the government through the tax rules tell you what what they'd like you what they want you to do in order to get those tax credits, right? They give you a tax credit. They want you to have children. They want you to be married. They want you to own a house. They want you to give to charity, and they want you to have a business. And they want and they want and they want you to get continuing education, and they want right. you to pay for your kids to go to college. All of those right. have tax credits associated with them. But the, the answer to the question, so that's what, what, what Dr. Richardson is talking about is how you, how you impact your tax filings at the end of the year. And there's some other things that you can do. I'm not a tax expert, but I will say this, owning your own business or having a side business is a way to, to add. If you're a W-2 employee, having a business 1099 income is a great way to create some tax advantages for you immediately. Because again, there's stuff that you can write off that you don't want normally wouldn't normally write off just in your course of your day to day. Again, I'm not a tax expert and I'm not a, ta I'm not a tax accountant. So like Heather doesn't control the markets, I don't control the tax law. But that being said, being creative in how you go about doing this and just being aware. And as, as Dr. Richardson saying, like wealthy people know how to legally not pay taxes. We can't be angry when wealthy people legally don't pay a lot of taxes. We just have to learn how to also not pay a lot of taxes Part of what we do in our financial education, I hope Dr. You do, and I hope Nina does this as well, is, is to get people act on, 
acclimated to what the tax rules are and ways that they can actually mitigate their tax exposure. For now, like again, a 401k retirement account brings your, brings your rate of income, income tax down for your current year. You're going to pay tax in the future on that though. So there's a way to manage all of that. There are ways to do that small, you know, in an intelligent fashion. Some people say overfund your 401k. I'm not necessarily a fan of that because I would say put enough, enough money into your 401k to get your employer's match. Because generally, I'll just say this, generally between the federal income tax rate and your state income tax rate, you're probably going to end up paying 40 to almost 50% tax on that money. So if it's 50%, you put in an amount and the company matches it, the company match is going to pay the tax. Anything above that, whoops, anything above that, you're going to pay the tax down the road. I'm not sure who's sharing the screen, but... Uh, but that's kind of what the rule, the rule is, right? You're going to pay the tax down the road. Oh, we're back to, we're back to this. Yeah. So, right. There's tax. <laughs> there's, a, there's places where you put your money that you're going to be taxed now, like your savings account, CDs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, short-term capital gains. You'll pay taxes. You'll pay taxes on the gains that you earn now. Tax deferred is your 401k. A 457 is the same as a 401k. That's just what, that's what the police and fire, anybody in public service, that's their version of a 401k. A 403B is what teachers have. It's the same thing as a 401k. It's a defined uh, uh, contribution plan. You'll pay the tax down the road. A couple of things that you can do now that are tax-free are basically a Roth IRA. And as we talked about before, cash accumulation and life insurance. It's one of the few things that you can. Now it's after-tax dollars that go in. So you, ha again, have to look at it. Make sure that you have some contribution to each one of these areas. Thank you, Derek, if you put that up there. Um, but those are the things that we talk about. That, you know, as it, when it comes to filing your specific taxes, I always tell people go to your tax accountant, talk about the things you do. Most tax accountants want you to save on the taxes for this year. They're not thinking about five, 10, 20 years down the road. Let, let's reduce your tax uh, exposure now. So sometimes with a grain of salt, a financial advisor in conjunction with, a, with your tax accountant is a good portfolio to have, as we talked about. It's kind of your team of experts that you're going to want to have access to that will guide you and give you input. Um, a lawyer like Andrew, an educator like Doc Richardson, you know, having people that have this kind of background are good people to have in your, we, in your resources so you can learn all the best ways to take advantage of tax, the tax implications now, in, in midterm, and then in the long term as well. Uh, rich people, um, one of the things that Brian alluded to when talking about rich people, I think it's important to understand is rich people, or I already want to define rich people, but it's moving to having most of your income in capital gains because capital gains income is taxed at a much lower rate than employment income, right? So, you know, if, if you're, if, if the bulk of your money is earned through your own business or <coughs> investments or a myriad of businesses or rental income from investment properties, you're going to be taxed much less on that income then you would be taxed if you earn the same amount of money from an employer. And it's a significant amount less. Like so half. I want to ask one other question, and Brian, I want to, maybe it's you or whoever, because I think you said something about, which is really um, something key about living longer and maybe having to go into some type of uh, adult care. Right. How do we prepare for that also that because I'm understanding a lot of times they go back and they look at your last, I think it's last three years of income, where they have a house of property also, and all that factors into your long term care. How do you prepare that? You know, you may not have a lot, but you can still need that long term care. I'm not too sure who, who would, who would. I'm, I had mentioned it just as something that we all need to be, have to be, you know, in considering partially because our baby boomers, which was the largest generation right after World War II, all of the baby boomers are beginning to retire now and turn 11,000 are turning, you know, 71 every single day. And long-term care is becoming an issue. The other thing that COVID exposed was that a lot of people don't really want to put their parents and their grandparents in a home, nursing home. So you have to look at what <laughs> options you have. So maybe you have nursing facility, you have nursing care in your home. So you have home care. There's a lot of things that factors that go into <clears throat> what kind of care you want to have for your, for, the, for, you know, I want to say our elderly, but, but people who, who require additional help. Um, Long-term care usually is if you can't do two or three of the six daily living activities, like 
showering, dressing, you know, eating, anything. You can't do those things on your own where you need assistance. That generally falls under long-term care. So long-term care, I mean, really the reality is you can buy a long-term care insurance policy. They're just extremely expensive. Um, You could put long-term care and life insurance. It makes it a little bit more affordable. This is interesting. In the state of Washington, they just passed in April, they just passed the Washington CARES law, which gave, which basically mandated that all Washington employers start to take out a 0.58% tax on all working, all working uh, uh, employees in the state of Washington to go towards a state-funded long-term care program, which sounds good. The problem is that the most that you can get is $100 a day. So that's $3,000 a month the average again annual uh, monthly stay in any kind of long term care need is is between ten and twelve thousand dollars a month. So I didn't really answer your question, Scott. I'm just telling you I and I don't really have the you know and I don't know if if if, if, the, if the studies have been done. I don't have the answer for what do we do uh, except for the fact that we need to be aware that it's a it's a concern. We need to start to look at this as something that we're going to have a lot of uh, that we're going to have to take advantage of because a lot of people are depleting their assets in order to pay for long-term care. So. so unfortunately, the time is running out. So we're going to have to figure out how to do a part three because <laughs> this is still too important. And we're, we seem like we're just at the, the point where we're really getting a great knowledge. And I don't know if people were taking notes. This was outstanding. And I wanted to, you know, I don't know. We have to figure out how to do a part three. So so please stay tuned before. We're, but I want to have to, uh, we have to start wrapping it up and I want to be able to to give our guests an opportunity to say something as we get ready to, to wrap this thing up. Uh, so so Derek, we haven't heard from you in a while, so I'll I'll get I'll throw you the, the pass first because you're part of the team now. Excellent. So are, are we doing uh goodbyes or are we well, uh well kind of wrapping up whatever you want to gotcha. do that's kind yep. of summations okay Yeah, no, I mean, I think the big takeaway for me that and really what you guys went over in the first session was just try to try to motivate people around you and in your community to to make a change. Right. And if 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 they're hesitant to make a change, just ask them, well, how how are things working out for you now? Right. Or how could how could they, you know, uh, um, work out if you take no action? 20 years or 30 years from now. Um, and then on top of that, um, after you've made the decision, right, everybody needs, needs, needs help in this area. So um, where would you turn? Who would you rely on? Um, what things are actionable? What, um, what actual investments or ways to position yourself better are available to you? So those are kind of the, the main takeaways I got. Devon? Yeah, this was all great. Um, I think just what I'll say, uh, having, I've done a lot of focus groups and qualitative research in this field of financial security and just knowing what I hear from households and from people, I think there are three things on my mind. The first is to the, as much as you can avoid high cost loans, uh, loans such as uh, uh, payday loans, title loans, check cashing, things that don't really, because there are debts that that help you build wealth, such as mortgages, but then there are debts that really don't do anything. But I know people do what they can. The second is, of course, like we've been all, we've all been saying is savings. Uh, people typically recommend about having about six months of savings in reserve. Uh, I just read a new study by AARP that said that having savings of at least 2,500,000 uh, $2,500, um, your probability of financial hardship decreases uh, pr- uh, in the short term uh, pretty uh, significantly, and it has the same effect after three years later. So just having that, that little buffer can, can do something. And then third, what someone has said, uh, you can't save your way to wealth building. So of course, invest. And you've heard all of these different investment tools today, so I don't have to go back through those. But that's, that's just my little tidbit. Um, Heather, I don't know if you had something. Well, well before you go, I want you to give me what, what was the little thing you said about the in the, in the river and the uh, river. In the oh, oh, about uh, so income is like a, a river, wealth is like a reservoir. Um, income can change on a dime, and wealth can change over generations. So it's a long game. So that's just something to keep in mind. We got to coin that. We coin it. Okay, Heather, you're up. 
<laughs> well, you know, I, I really can't add too many more words of wisdom to what Devon shared. I mean, she's just right on the money, you know, for the pun pun sake, but um, you know, the only thing I add is, you know, I don't know, take your kids to the beach at the reservoir. Just, you know, don't, yeah. don't forget about the kids, <laughs> you know, talk to them early, talk to them now, even if it scares you, get them involved. And, you know, your kid can be that kid in the video and, you know, you can, you can change that outcome generationally. All right. Captain Nina. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. I would add just to start talking to young people early because they they're hungry they're just like in every area of life there are people who are hungry and want it but just don't know where to start and there are people who just you know don't want it but there are plenty who want it and it's just about helping to come alongside them ask those questions engage them on those questions because knowledge the network the experience is what's going to open up the avenues to financial health and wealth early on. So if we can just start really coming alongside our young people, volunteering with organizations like Student Dream, we're just gonna be great. <laughs> What's that website again? Studentdream.org. Yeah, you got I'll put that? It in the chat. Okay, thank you. All right, Pastor Brian. Um, I would say thank you, by the way, for letting me participate. I feel like I kind of took over some of, some of the conversation, but I just, I, I want, you know, there's either, generational poverty or generational wealth, right? And the idea is that no matter where you are, stop the chain and give yourself an opportunity to create genera generational wealth. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of companies that want to help. Our company has no limitation. You know, somebody mentioned Merrill Lynch, you know, you have to have a million dollars liquid assets to be able to qualify for Merrill Lynch private, you know, consulting. We don't have a minimum. In our perspective, we want everybody to win, whether you're a student coming out of school, getting ready to, to start, your, start your life, or you're, you're 70 years old and ready to you know, look at retirement. Like Our company wants to help everybody. Um, we give opportunity to people to not only learn about finances, but actually to come into the business and be part of the conversation. I can go into communities and impact one person, but if I can go impact one person, they can go into their community and impact the entire community. We've done, an, we've done a, an amazing job and that's what our company wants to do. We want to educate people and, um, and get them to go change their community. Again, I focus on the special needs community, but every community needs to be helped and served in the area of finances, so. Right, I was gonna ask you, can you say a little bit more about uh, special needs? Uh, I'll just, uh, sure, I'll, really quick. I, I have a daughter who had learning disabilities and one of my colleagues had a son on the autism spectrum and we started doing the work that we do for, for families uh, in the special needs community and we, you know, we, those, those, folk, those folks are generally concerned about educational resources and occupational resources and, and other therapies. And they think about what happens to, is my child going to get through school? Are they going to get a job? Are they going to have, you know, living, independent living? They don't think, oh my God, what happens to my child when I pass away or is something protected? So things like, uh, you know, like special needs trusts and ABLE accounts and things that can be put in place financially so that those children are taken care of as they become adults and get into independent living our company, or at least in, within our company, it's one of the areas that I focus on just because I'm a member of that community and I can, I can relate to that community. And so I know, what, I know what those folks are going through. So um, I have a podcast that we do every week called Just Two Dads, where we're just two dads talking about these are the kinds of things that impact special needs families. So yeah, I'm done. So no, no I'm not saying we're done. I'm not, I want to connect with you because, you know, oh, good. Cause, you know, I work with fathers around New York City. So my whole all the work I do at DY City is around fatherhood and so like that. And I know that we always find guys and people who have children with special needs. So I, that's what I'm saying. I okay, want to good. More with you about, about that. So um, I love that. Okay. Thank so, you. So our resident attorney, I'm going to turn to Andrew. Oh, uh, thank you very much for having me. Just um, as touching on what Brian said, my son is also autistic. And um, that's something that uh, you know, we're involved in as well. It's a lot of like, things like ABLE accounts and, you know, what, 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 what tools are out there for special needs planning is becoming quite important. Again, the question we always ask is what happens when we're gone, right? Um, um, but just generally, uh, what, what, what I think was great about this um, tonight, especially, was the notion of learning and ongoing conversations. But as people who are in, in the field in various ways of giving advice, sometimes we assume knowledge that we shouldn't assume, right? Like we don't, 
Like we, we assume people, everybody knows that your housing, your rent and mortgage shouldn't be more than a quarter of your income, right? Everybody knows that. People don't know that, right? Um, everybody knows that, you know, you shouldn't have more than 35 or 36 percent um, total debt service for, you know, as in connection to your income. Not everybody knows that. The rule is 72. A lot of people don't know that. And, and we kind of assume that, 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 that everybody knows this. Um, and I think going back to the very, very, very basics it is important, you know, um, not, not living above your means just as a start, you know, um, you can't save what you don't have or what you don't earn as a start, that you can't save your way to wealth, you know, as a long-term idea, as a concept, you know, these are things people don't have. So uh, I think it's important and I'm sort of uh, glad that that came up quite a lot tonight. Uh, and to our surgeon in general here at the barbershop, last but not least, the Dr. Richardson. <laughs> thank you for that. Listen, I want to thank all of the, the, the folks who participated, both in the last session and in this session. We are participating, we're launching, we're stirring this dialogue. But to the listeners who are listening to this, at the core of all of the good advice you've been hearing, at the core of all of it, is your own personal basic understanding of the basics of money, of the basics of finance. They didn't teach us that in grade school. They didn't teach us that in high school. They didn't teach us that in college. You can have a degree in nuclear physics and have and be broke because you have no idea how to handle money. So I would uh, invite you all, if you don't have a, a source of getting that basic fundamental knowledge right now, go to my website. It's called decisionsdecisionsnow.com decisionsdecisionsnow.com. There's eight courses there <clears throat> that are part of this training. Budgeting, handling credit, home ownership, savings and investment, services of a bank, buying insurance, income taxes, social security and Medicare. If those aren't the basics, I don't know what are. But wherever you have to go to get that basic education, choose to do that. Wow, this was awesome. And, uh, and Mike and Jerry, I don't know, I think we have to figure out how to do a part three. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I apologize yeah, for, we, to those listeners that we didn't get to the chat. Any questions from the, from the, from the group? I don't even know if there's any questions in there. But uh, I'm sorry, I apologize now. But Mike and Jerry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, we, we should do a part three. We usually get to the chat a lot earlier. And, uh, and I'm sorry for those that didn't get answers to questions. There's one I saw somebody uh, threw my way if there were recommendations between permanent and, and uh, term insurance. And I, I think what we heard earlier is like a lot of other issues, no one is giving legal advice, no one's giving financial advice, but they're <clears throat> raising some of these distinctions so everyone can be aware of them. I think we should go with what uh, Nina, Nina said, everyone needs to build out their team. You know, so and and uh, when you have folks like you know brothers putting out their websites and their resources, start there and get get some information. You know, um, and uh, you know David will drop a larger resource list later on. Um, there's so much I could say. I don't want to steal time from uh, from you and Jerry. I would just say we were smart enough to know to do this in two sessions because we knew we couldn't do it in one. So I'm not surprised that we may need to do three sessions, but a lot, a lot of gems. I appreciate that when we talk about keeping it 100, we really held on to this idea about keeping it 700 and changing the atmosphere. Who is in our camp, you know, paying it forward and starting to educate our children earlier about money and, and demystify some of these conversations. The more they know early on, the better they'll grow later on, you know? So um, yeah, I, I could go on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna restrain myself and pass it over to Jerry. How are you feeling after tonight, Jerry? I feel, I feel exceptionally full. Um, and even more important than that, because we don't get to have these conversations uh, just amongst our people, family and everyone else. I feel exceptionally safe. I was really led to say that um, mainly because I remember when my daughter was really, really little, uh, maybe six years old, and we went to McDonald's and her first thing that came out of my mouth, okay, what? We need to get something off of the dollar menu. And I'm like, where, where did that come from? And I, I say that to say, just being around different 
other family members, she already had a certain mentality, like this is the only way to spend it. So the, the nuggets that I've heard, um, and even the way I've, I've raised her just to be more uh, financially sound, a nugget that I've heard about teaching our children early, um, what does that look like knowing full term? Brian, I thank you. Andrew, I thank you for just putting things in order. It really showed that one, it is very, very, very accessible to create an impact on generational wealth. And it can be very real for you right now, today. And so for everyone listening, these are uh, real stories. This is not just a platform to speak, but really tools and resources for you to activate in this moment that will change the concept of your world right now. And so I am full, I am grateful, and I am humble just to be able to sit and listen in on this panel. So as we come to the close of another barbershop, um, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, from this episode, uh, Building Wealth, and from our last episode about understanding. For our guests out there, please remember this. You got to keep it 700. Not 100, 700. Also, you got to be able to deal with sacrifice. You're going to have to sacrifice if you're going to want to look at building wealth. You also have to be able to understand your budget. You can't, you can't spend more than you make. You have to understand that. You gotta be able to look at your budget and know where you're purchasing. As Dr. Richardson said, every time you make a purchase, think of five other things you have to pay with that one purchase. So you have to make sure you understand that. And then also we wanna be able, if you're in debt, you gotta learn how to either cascade or you have to snowball your way out. One way or the other, you gotta learn how to get out of debt. So you gotta be able to move forward. And then when you talk about building wealth, you gotta look at how you can build wealth. There's many different ways you can do it. Remember the rule of 72. You gotta understand that. If you're gonna do anything, it's the rule of 72. How to grow your money or grow what you're doing. And you'll never be able to save your way out of debt. Understand that. You're not gonna save enough money to be wealthy. So you have to be able to be a little bit of a risk taker and you gotta get your team together, as Naomi said. You gotta get your team together. <laughs> Who's on your team? What lawyers, what bankers, what investment people are on your team to help you educate yourself so that you can be a wealthy person. So as always, we love to have you here at the DYCD Barbershop. We want to uh, encourage you that if you have any questions or anything, you can uh, see the flyer Dave put up before that you uh, can contact us, send us information. Uh, if you want to join, make sure you, uh, you like what you said, connect with the DYCD uh, um, page so that anytime we have alerts coming out, you can be contacted with that. So we would love to have and hear from you in the future. So at this time, we're signing off tonight from the DYCD Barbershop, and we wish you a long life and a lot of wealth. So our guests, please hold on as we close out our YouTube channel and we'll see everybody next